Yeah. So now I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight, Beth Parnixa. Um, Beth's credentials and knowledge about this period of our history are exemplary. She was a graduate of West Virginia University in 2011, specializing in historic interpretation through social and digital media. She served as a park ranger and historian at Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Park for nine years before joining the Appomattox Courthouse National Historic Park. In March of this year, Beth became a prestigious member of the advisory board at the University of Virginia's John L. Now Center for Civil War History. And more recently, she accepted a new position as the branch manager of interpretation and education for Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania County Battlefields National Military Park. Beth will detail how Appomattox signaled the end of the war and the beginning of the trials and tribulations of the Reconstruction era and her discussion of the legacy of Appomattox. Beth? Thank you so much. Okay, first thing, I've heard, I've heard that sound is an issue. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Oh, wow. The Sometimes we just focus on the first steps, right? Um, thank you all so much for having me this evening. Um, it's really been a delight to be here and to meet most of you this evening. Um, we're here to talk about something that I think is a really important topic. Of course, I'm a little biased, um, but it's definitely near to my heart uh, as we talk about Appomattox, um, what it's meant through the years and what it means to us today. So as you've heard, I worked at Appomattox. I've worked at Appomattox for about four years, um, but I've worked with the Civil War for a lot longer. And I think it's really important for us as Civil War scholars, people interested in the subject that we think about, you know, when we're talking about these topics, how, how basically how do we remember them through time? Of course, memory studies is now almost old hat to everybody, but thinking about Appomattox more than just the events that took place there, but really what it means to us today. So I'm going to start off by saying thank you, uh, not only to y'all for having me, but also to my many colleagues at Appomattox who have helped me with this research, have done some of this research and shared it with me. Um, and, you know, other scholars in the field who are also doing great work on these subjects. Um, also, just as sort of a fair warning, I do like to ask a lot of questions as we go throughout, since we're a very large group. I'm going to say let's treat most of those rhetorically, um, but there may be some times when I ask you to raise your hand um, if you feel a certain way. Um, so please feel free to participate as much or as little as you would like. Um, I promise not to call anybody out in the middle of this auditorium. Um, I found that's not conducive to everybody having a good time. Um, but yes, please interact as much or as little as you'd like. Um, and just want to have everybody, you know, be thoughtful while we have this conversation and also to think about, you know, your experiences and how they influence how you view these events, as well as the experiences that other people have had that might influence how they view events differently. So my first big question is to ask you all to think about what do you think was the legacy of Appomattox? You know, we usually think about when we think about Appomattox, you've got sort of the gentleman's agreement, the handshake scenes between Lee and Grant. Um, there's sort of a mystique around the surrender. We get a lot of questions, not just about, you know, is this building original? Sorry, guys, it's not. Um, if you've ever been to Appomattox Courthouse, it is a reconstruction. The McLean House is a reconstruction. You know, po folks will ask questions about what the generals were wearing, what they were thinking at that time. Um, a lot of folks will come in with a really strong narrative about the magnanimity between these two generals, between Lee and Grant. But there's a little bit more to the reality once you start to get, um, once you start to dive in deep to the question here. It's not just a matter of were they kind and gentlemanly to each other, but what did this surrender represent? And then what did it mean to us as Americans? So think about this. Do you think that the country started off on the right foot to reunion based on the surrender at Appomattox? So again, remember there's a difference between personal civility and then 
actual national state of affairs. Civility does not equal reunion. And also remember that Lincoln's assassination happens just days later on April 15th. So the surrender at Appomattox is April 9th of 1865, and just a few days later um, in our nation's capital, an immense tragedy plays out. So how did we get here? Let's back up a little bit and talk about how we get to the surrender in the first place. So, perfect. Um, so you have essentially the story of the Overland Campaign in the spring of 1864, which ends up in a siege of Petersburg, and then the siege around Petersburg after nine months, there's a breakout or a breakthrough with Grant's armies finally breaking that siege on April 2nd, and then pursuing Lee constantly um, since that date, really up until Lee's surrender. So if you look at this map, and I know that it may be hard for some of you all to see the details, and so I'm just going to say from the start, we're not going to worry about the details. The talk is not about the campaign, so don't worry too much. Part of what I want you to see is this tangle of lines crisscrossing across the map uh, to really understand how much effort it takes um, for the Union Army to actually pin down Robert E. Lee. He's on the run. His goal is to move further west. He thinks if he can move west and then south, he can meet up with Joe Johnston in North Carolina. Um, and he's unsuccessful in doing that. Grant, um, through a variety of multiple forces moving in different ways in different places, as you can see those blue threads across the map here, is able to corner him um, and trap him at a place called Appomattox Courthouse. There's a few significant engagements along the way. You also have Robert E. Lee suffering from a great number of desertions along the way. So the Confederate Army is slowly falling apart through casualties, through desertions, and then finally cornered by Union armies um, on April 9th. So that morning, Robert E. Lee will try one last attack to break out of the trap that Grant has laid for him and is unsuccessful. When that attack fails, he realizes that he has a Union army on either side of him, and he doesn't have any good options to get out. His only remaining options are either to fight to the death or to resort to guerrilla warfare, and he doesn't want to do either of those things. So Robert E. Lee decides that it's time to surrender. The terms of surrender, as most of you have probably heard, are very generous. So Ulysses S. Grant offers essentially that all the men can return to their homes as long as they agree not to take up arms against the federal government again. So the quote itself from the surrender terms says, this done, officers and men will be allowed to return to their homes, not to be disturbed by the United States authority as long as they observe their parole and the laws in force where they may reside. Does this seem right? So I'm gonna ask, this is our first group activity, please raise your hand if you think that Grant and Lincoln's decision to give generous terms and paroles to the surrendering Confederates was a good idea. This is not a trap. Okay, yeah. Um, so it makes sense, right? And in the, and this is not only Grant's way of thinking, but it's also coming straight from, from Abraham Lincoln, who feels that the best way to bring the country back together again is to be generous to former Confederates that there will only be more bitterness between the sides if there are lengthy war tribunals, if there are prisoner of war camps with soldiers you know, waiting to be tried. And in a lot of ways, this makes a lot of sense, right? As Lincoln put it, he wants to let him up easy. And so that is what Grant does. If you were a Confederate though, how might you receive this? Hopefully pretty well, right? There's one man who said, Grant and his men treated us nobly, more nobly than was ever a conquered army treated before or since. The conduct of the Federals on this occasion was soothing and comforting beyond anything that words can express. That's a surgeon from Alabama. So you can see that for a lot of Confederates, this is something that's, that's met well. You know, Lincoln has a good idea behind his movement here. But by letting the Confederates go home without suffering any consequences, he also sets up and a different sort of dynamic where the Confederates are also able, as they go home, to write their own narratives about how this war happened, about what transpired, how they came to lose. And so you see, even as early as April 10th of 1865, the very next day, Robert E. Lee issues his farewell orders, General Orders Number 9, um, which he didn't exactly write himself, but he edited and approved. So these are from Robert E. Lee, his words, to his men. And he wrote, because I know you also can't read, 
this. Um, so I'll read it to you. It says, after four years of arduous service, marked by unsurpassed courage and fortitude, the Army of Northern Virginia has been compelled to yield to overwhelming numbers and resources. I need not tell the brave survivors of so many hard-fought battles who have remained steadfast to the last that I have consented to this result from no distrust of them, but feeling that valor and devotion could accomplish nothing that would compensate for the loss that must have attended the continuance of the contest, I determined to avoid the useless sacrifice of those whose past services have endeared them to their countrymen. It's a really nice message, isn't it? Yeah. So, and this is from Robert E. Lee, even though he, you know, didn't pen these words himself, they clearly represent the way he's feeling at the end of, of the war, after his surrender. He says some very specific things, though. He's certainly praising his men for their service, for their time in service, for their valor and devotion that they have dedicated to the cause. But he also says some very clear and specific things about why the Confederacy failed. He says in his very first sentence here that the Army of Northern Virginia was compelled to yield to overwhelming numbers and resources. Do you think that Ulysses S. Grant would agree with that assessment? You can raise your hands again. Yes? How many think no? No. Yeah, what might, I, I have a feeling that Grant, although a fairly humble man, might say that his armies also had something to do with it. Granted, that could be considered the overwhelming numbers, but also Grant's strategy, right, that he's employed in the field against the Confederate Army. But this gives a narrative, sort of another honor to both sides kind of narrative, right? And then take a look at these images. So you can see that General Orders Number 9 is reprinted throughout the South. Um, this is something that Confederate veterans might have purchased might have been a nice Christmas gift, is, uh, is a version of Lee's farewell address for your veteran. Um, certainly would have been up in a lot of Confederate-leaning households in the aftermath of the war. And so you see these kind of illustrations um, making the speech very nice, right? And this is, going, this is going to influence, so all of this is sort of building how people view Appomattox, right? So we have one narrative right now. This is a narrative from Robert E. Lee. That same day, I think it's also worth mentioning that there is a conversation between Lee and Grant. So they have their meeting on April 9th, the famous meeting, and then they have another meeting the next day on April 10th. And that day, Grant asked Robert E. Lee if he would surrender the other armies in the field. And this is an interesting moment for Robert E. Lee because he technically commands all Confederate forces at this time, but he says that he doesn't have the authority to surrender those other armies in the field. And I wouldn't say that he's just avoiding the responsibility. I think for Lee, it is mostly because Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, has said that the armies are supposed to keep fighting. And so Lee doesn't feel as though he can speak for those other armies in the field because a higher authority in the form of the president of the Confederacy has already said, no, you're going to keep fighting. So the same day, that Lee is sending out this message, overwhelmed by numbers and resources. He's also saying, I'm, I'm not able to surrender these other armies in the field. So the fighting continues. Um, there's going to be continued, continued fighting in the Civil War for, bless you, for many months to come. Um, this is, however, the first domino to fall. So we don't often think of Appomattox as a beginning, but it is sort of the beginning of the end. And it's the beginning of these sort of narratives that we're going to see as different groups of people start to make meaning out of what Appomattox means to them. So we can see in a lot of ways here already, you know, this is day literally day one after the surrender at Appomattox, and Appomattox is already going beyond the battlefield and beyond the surrender and its terms. So we're going to take a quick sidebar now. We're going to go to a couple of different spots around the village at Appomattox to see what different sites in Appomattox, how they speak to the surrender, beyond just the McLean house and the room where the surrender took place. So our first stop is this site right here, the grave of Lafayette Meeks. So Lafayette Meeks is someone that most of you have probably never heard of. He's certainly not a famous soldier by any means. He joined the forming cavalry company under Captain Joel Walker Flood, the Appomattox Rangers. He mustered in June 3rd of 1861. 
She's one of the early volunteers from the Appomattox community. His father, Francis, had just bought a store in town. And Lafayette Meeks died at the age of 18 on October 4th of that same year from typhoid. So he's the first Appomattox loss of life from all of those who had yet made it to the main army. And we have no evidence that Lafayette Meeks ever even saw a battle. We can't find that he was serving at, at Manassas. We think he was already sick. So here's somebody who's already died, um, not even having seen a battle, brought back to Appomattox as one of the first casualties. So a lot of times we think of Appomattox at the end of the war. We think about how the armies brought the war to Appomattox in 1865. But truly, Lafayette Meeks brought the meanings of war home as early as 1861. So after... Uh, Lafayette's death, two days later, his father Francis collected the body from the railroad station, drove his son's remains from Appomattox Station back to the store, um, and basically buries him in the backyard of the Plunkett Meeks store. They hold a small funeral. It's attended by what dignitaries are left in the town, uh, County Clerk George Pierce and William Hicks, the deputy of the sheriff. But this is really the first, like I said, the first real strike home for the folks living in Appomattox. But I want you to think about not just the loss of Lafayette Meeks starting as early as October of 1861, but what the loss of life of men like Lafayette Meeks, North and South across the nation, how that would really reverberate and resonate through time. So this is just one soldier in 1861. We know that it's going to actually be more like 700,000 men dying, North, South, mourning families, and so then you start to ask, okay, so we have Lafayette Meeks, we have many others um, coming home as casualties from um, to Appomattox from the war. If you're a family back home in Appomattox, how are you going to mourn? So certainly they have a small funeral. They set up a fairly large uh, gravestone for Lafayette Meeks. It's one of the most noteworthy graves in the entire uh, community for an 18-year-old Um but it tells us, I think, a little bit about how this family came to mourn and about how Southerners, as well as Northerners, were going to approach this war and how they were going to mourn. I think it's also important for us to think about how that's going to be different. So the grief aspect is the same, North and South, right? We're all human beings. We all have families, friends, loved ones. That, that element is a commonality. But if your loved one was a Union soldier, you had the comfort that he died for a cause that won, ultimately, that his sacrifice was not in vain. If your loved one was a Southern soldier fighting for the Confederacy, things might be a little bit different. How might you feel about the causes that your loved one died for, given that the Confederacy lost the war? And then what did the living suffer for, those who are coming home maimed or with mental health issues and then how do you start to mourn? How do you rebuild? How do you mourn the loss, not just of your people, but also of your nation? Because the Confederacy, we're not going to argue today whether it was or was not a nation. We don't have time. Um, but to the people who lived in the Confederacy and supported it, it surely was a nation to them. And so how do you mourn the loss, not only of your loved ones, but also of your brand new nation? And then how did you find ways to prop up and enshrine a past in a way that sticks with us today? I know I don't really need to ask people to raise their hands here, but who can think of a way that the Confederacy has enshrined their memory with us? Go ahead and raise your hands. It's fun, right? How's the monuments, right? Um, popular culture. Who watched the Dukes of Hazard? You can be honest. It's okay, right? So this is, is not just a piece of, of saying, you know, we are mourning our loved ones. We are trying to enshrine their memory. We're going to remind people of the Confederacy, of this loss, of this suffering for generations. And that is a stated goal for many loved ones, many organizations, many people who are mourning and forming these organizations. And so we see their efforts at memorialization continuing with us today. Sometimes in memorialization, 
it's worth noting that um, there were other motivations behind that memorialization than just mourning the dead. Because you're not just mourning the dead, right? You're saying that the dead did not die in vain. The wounded and injured did not die in vain. They died for a cause. And if they died for that cause, it must have been the right cause, right? Must have been just. You don't actually have to agree. No, no answers needed for this one. And so we have a marker here at Appomattox, um, which we're, we're actually still digging into exactly how we got this marker. It's an ongoing investigation in the park. If any of you know where this came from, please let me know. Um, but we have a marker that has been in the park's property and on our in our possession and on our property uh, since, as far as we can tell, about 1929, before the Park Service or the government even owned property in Appomattox. So somebody placed this marker to what took place at Appomattox long before anyone who looked like me and was a park ranger worked there. And this marker says, again, for those of you who can't, can't read it all the way in the back, it says Appomattox. Here on Sunday, April 9th, 1865, after four years of heroic struggle in defense of principles believed fundamental to the existence of our government, Lee surrendered 9,000 men, the remnant of an army still unconquered in spirit. And some of you with eagle eyes out there might notice that something's been blotted off the marker. And that part said, still unconquered in spirit, to 118,000 men under Grant. So, hmm, I'm hearing some hmms, right? Um, and I'm hoping that part of that is some of you students of Appomattox who are like, wait a minute, that doesn't add up. Um, because you're right. So firstly, those numbers don't add up. That's number one issue with this marker right here, is that Lee surrendered approximately 30,000 men at Appomattox. And this marker says he surrendered 9,000. Grant had about 65,000 on hand at Appomattox, so that's also a lot less than 118,000. So you can see that this marker already just in the information that it is providing is telling a story, right, that a vastly outnumbered Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia surrendered to a massive Union force. But it says more, right? It says, after four years of heroic struggle and defensive principles believed fundamental to the existence of our government. What were those principles? Were they fundamental to our government? Did our government persist after the end of the Confederacy? But of course, there are plenty of folks who would say that it shouldn't have. And those might have been some of the folks responsible for placing this marker. So it's... A really interesting piece, I think, about when we're talking about different narratives about what Appomattox means and about what kind of story we're telling ourselves about the end of the war, right? So you have people like Robert E. Lee who are sharing a specific narrative about why the Confederacy lost. You've got folks mourning, like the Meeks family, and so far, and now you've got somebody who's placing a tablet so that anybody who comes to Appomattox is going to read this and think certain things about the Confederacy and about the end of the war. So we're already seeing a lot of these different narratives coming together. But wait, there's more. <laughs> so um, we've mostly been talking about Confederate memory so far. So we're going to start looking at some other narratives, which I think are very interesting. And I'm not sharing uh, just as a, as a PS, because I know that you all want to get home sometime tonight. I won't be sharing every narrative and every memory <laughs> of Appomattox. But I do think it's important for us to look at a couple different ones. Um, so what you see here are um, two tools for shoemaking. You might be wondering where I'm going with this, but uh, these, these tools belong to a man named John Robinson, who lived in Appomattox Courthouse. Um, John Robinson, we don't know much about him before the war. We know that he was enslaved. We don't know where, and we don't know exactly what he did, but because he becomes a cobbler or a shoemaker, Apparently there's a difference and we're still not sure which one he was. He worked with shoes. Um, he probably gained those skills while enslaved. Uh, but he, but again, we don't really know much about him except that he was enslaved in the area. Post-war, he testified that as the armies were moving in this area and in Virginia, that he said to wish the Yankees would come and set us free. That is what we were all looking for and praying for. So he's testi testifying on behalf of uh, a friend of his to share that they were both Union sympathizers during the war, although 
not free to do so. John Robinson, I think, is really interesting because, of course, April 9th is the Surrender Day, but it is also Freedom Day to local citizens of Appomattox. Actually, more than half the county at that time would have celebrated April 9th as Freedom Day rather than a day of the surrender. So for John Robinson, Freedom Day, April 9th, plays a huge role in his life. Not only does he gain his freedom, but he's soon able to act on that freedom in ways that a lot of other enslaved people were not able to do so. So he's living in his own home in 18, or excuse me, in Appomattox by 1866. He has it under contract to own by 1871, and he pays it off within five years. That is a dream that none of us may ever see again, paying off a home in five years. But John Robinson did. He also registered to vote in 1866. He operated his cobbler's shop out of the basement of his home until 1925, when he moved the shop to town. So the town of Appomattox kind of picked up and moved to where the railroad station was three miles away. So in 1925, this man, surely in his at least 80s by then, was actually walking all the way to town to continue to operate his business. He raised his children in that home. He sent his children to the Freedmen's Bureau School, and he helped to found the first African-American church in Appomattox, Galilee Baptist Church. Galilee was also the site of the second Freedmen's Bureau School, which was first established in November of 1865 in the village itself and then moved to Galilee later. And Galilee Baptist Church and that Freedmen's Bureau School also have some interesting stories when we're talking about what freedom and surrender actually means in Appomattox and the surrounding area. The first teacher at the Freedmen's Bureau School, um, which is later called uh, the Plymouth Rock School because this teacher was from Massachusetts. His name's Charles McMahon. He's the first teacher, and he's almost run out of town by threats from locals who didn't want him there teaching uh, the African-American students in Appomattox Courthouse. Other locals stepped in to convince him to stay, however. But we see through that that Reconstruction in Appomattox is a mixed bag, right? You have some newly freed African-Americans like John Robinson who are able to shape their lives in the ways that they see fit because of the opportunities of freedom, but then you also see others who are struggling, um, some who are not able to rise above basically um, being almost enslaved, being sharecroppers, or being, you know, domestic help, being paid a low wage or, no, or almost no wage. Um, you also have an Appomattox, the Ku Klux Klan operating. So on April 30th of 1868, we have a report at the Freedmen's Bureau, a statement in regards to outrages committed upon John North and Fleming Johnson. Fleming Johnson is another founder of Galilee Baptist Church. Uh, by citizens in Appomattox County in disguise on Sabbath night, April 26th, 1868. The in disguise part, that's, that's how we know that they were the Klan. They have further reports. In early May of 1868, there's another report saying the report of Charles W. McMahon, Freedman, Bureau, or Freedman School Teacher at Appomattox Courthouse in reference to acts of violence committed by the Ku Klux Klan in reply, that you will instruct the freedmen to prepare themselves for their own protection against these lawless acts, and if molested by these, or any other, bans in the manner related, to defend themselves like free men, and the law and the power of this government will sustain them in thus defending their lives and liberties. So what does that mean? Well, it says that they are free men, and they are essentially on their own to defend themselves and the government will back them up. If you were one of those people, how would you feel about that? You can, you can yes, you can laugh. I know that I work for the federal government, but it is okay. <laughs> I would have the same reaction. You want me to what against the Ku Klux Klan? Me, especially in, the, in that scenario as a, as a person of color, it's not the best response, right, from the government. We're not always helpful. We do try to be. But in this case, basically telling these folks, these new citizens of Appomattox, that they're on their own to try to defend themselves against people who are unwilling to let Appomattox be the end, right? Again, another report in May of 1868, just as another example of the things that are going on in Appomattox in the aftermath of the war. Um, 
A person named Avon Owen stated that William Carson of Appomattox County took her two boys away with him to work during the year of 1866 and asks that she receive their wages. So it's fairly common um, for white property owners to go ahead and sort of swoop in and especially take up young uh, African-American people and have them continue to work for them as sort of a, an indenture situation. And here's a woman who has to petition not for her son's back, but just to, to get their wages even. So I would say that the promises of Appomattox in terms of freedom are falling short for many of the actual citizens who lived in Appomattox courthouse. They are dealing with a clan, a paramilitary group. They're dealing with um, not not being given their full rights as citizens, even the rights to some of the wages that they or their dependents are, are making. So that's yet another view of the aftermath of Appomattox and what it means to another group of people. But interestingly enough, Appomattox has another life within the African-American community as well. So this is a, a telegram. Again, y'all probably can't read it, but I will read it to you. Um, but this is from... Um, or this is with regard to what was known as an Appomattox Club, which, again, biased, but I think that has to be the coolest club, right? It's the Appomattox Club. Um, the Appomattox Clubs that were formed around the nation were civic and political organizations. So think like Kiwanis Club, Lions Club, um, the Moose Lodge, those sorts of, of organizations that were for civic good. Uh, this one is created for Black men across America. This, the one that sent this telegram uh, was formed in 1900 in Chicago. Uh, it promotes Black political leaders, including its organizer, Edward Wright, who was elected as Republican Ward Committeeman in the second ward in 1920. So not only is it an organization named after Appomattox, but it also actually works. So it takes them some years to really get their footing in a lot of places. The advancement is slow, just like in white civic organizations or political machines, there is some corruption inherent in these organizations, uh, but it does aid in advancing the cause of African-American representation. It also hosts social events like W.E.B. Dubois uh, and Paul Robeson coming to visit these clubs. And so this, I actually, I'm not reading this. Uh, I don't have it in my notes, so let me read it carefully here. Uh, this is asking what day the club can have two hours with W.E.B. Dubois for a reception during his visit in Chicago. So that's the text of the telegram itself. So having these sort of luminaries within the Black community coming to visit the Appomattox clubs is another way that African Americans are just sort of defining their own meanings to Appomattox in a way that's actually a lot more empowering than what you might have actually seen on the ground in Appomattox as an African American person. And I have this great quote um, from a woman named Margaret Burroughs, who was on the scene when Paul Robeson came to the club in Chicago. And she said, Paul shook my hand. Me, an insignificant, odd, and frightened black daughter of a worker with just as much warmth, sincerity, and interest as he did the furred and sequined, fancily dressed dowagers of the black bourgeoisie. And Paul Robeson, as many of you likely know, is not just an artist, but also a musician, um, but also a very outspoken activist for black rights. And so having him at a place like the Appomattox Club is really powerful and meaningful. Um, he once said that artists are the gatekeepers of truth. We are civilization's radical voice. And so he saw that uh, interconnected with the work that he did as a musician. But the Appomattox clubs are not just in Chicago. There's one that opens up in Washington, D.C. There's one in 1929 in Beaumont, Texas. There's one in the 1930s in Berkeley, California. Uh, there's one in Ontario, Canada, Little Rock, Arkansas in 1923, and Farmville, Virginia just down the road from Appomattox in 1910. So it isn't a massive club. You may have never heard of it, just as, as you would have certainly heard of the Moose Lodge, et cetera. But they are small, but they are present, and they are doing, um, doing the work of activism in the African-American community under the name of Appomattox and sort of making their own meanings out of Appomattox as a name and a place. And then our final... Uh, example of Appomattox being used for other purposes is more of an interesting and fun kind of one. This is an ad for an Appomattox club, which is advertised as the finest colored recreational club resort in the world in Los Angeles, California, 
most of the people in California, I'm not sure if they even know how to pronounce Appomattox, although that's a nationwide phenomenon, so I really shouldn't, shouldn't judge. But clearly, the organizers of this club felt like Appomattox had that kind of resonance, right? And so they chose this name for a reason, and they chose it to be a premier African-American resort. This advertisement comes from 1930. We still, again, ongoing investigation. We don't really know much more about it than that. Um, but we're still learning. We're still researching. Love to know what this resort came to and what, what folks thought about it from visiting a place like this. So we see Appomattox as this sort of really interesting example of something that can be used almost no matter who you are to make your own meanings of the end of the war and of reconstruction and of the world to come. You know, by the, even still in the 1920s and 30s, people are widely using Appomattox to mean something to them. To locals, as I think I mentioned before, the surrender, April 9th, is seen as Appomattox Day, or Freedom Day, or Emancipation Day, because it is where emancipation becomes official for the local residents in Appomattox Courthouse. So here's a quote from a newspaper in Pamplin, Virginia, just down the road, April 9th, 1898. So some 30 years plus after the end of the war. And they're still saying, our colored citizens turned out today at this place by the hundreds from all directions to celebrate their freedom. So this is an ongoing annual celebration for folks in the Appomattox area to say, that's right, this is a Freedom Day. But it's not universal. So there was a proposal for a blue and gray jubilee at Appomattox in 1915. Do you think everyone had recovered from the war by 1915? Time for, time for reunion? Probably not. So it's a really interesting thing, right? Because veteran reunions were fairly common and they certainly happened before 1915. People were getting together, sharing their common experiences. But this particular proposal for a blue-gray jubilee went down in flames. Uh, there was an editorial in the Richmond News Leader that said specifically, the South would ask the North to remember that if this is the half century of the amnesty proclamation and the disbandment of the armies, it is also the half century of the surrender of Lee and of the movement for the enfranchisement of blacks. So I think it's important to, to keep in, to think about the tone that they're using here. It's not just a polite reminder to say, hey, we might still have some hard feelings. It's showing us also that in the aftermath of Appomattox, the aftermath of the Civil War, that white supremacy is such an understood norm, certainly to the audiences reading it in Richmond, and let's be real, most of America at that time, that the idea of voting, of having freedmen voting, is assumed to be wrong and painful. You can tell it by the way they've written this article. So we see again the balances of challenges and opportunities when we look at Reconstruction, when we look at how other people are looking at Appomattox, and their memory of the end of the war. So we're going to come back to that question at the beginning of, was it a good plan, essentially, for Grant to offer these generous terms? And I think the problem is, of course, we can't change them, and we don't know what would have happened if something else had been done differently. So I think what's more useful to us, instead of asking, well, what could we have done better, is for us to understand how the decisions made at the surrender, made at Appomattox, and in the time both before and immediately after, led us to the place that we are today. So today, sadly, I can't promise you a rainbow every time you visit Appomattox Courthouse, uh, but if you do come to the park, you will see um, a park that was established, as, as they put it in their historic resource study, to fittingly commemorate the ending of one of the mightiest struggles of all time, which led eventually to a more united nation of better understanding in every section, and therefore it was proposed to establish a national area. It was established for historical and educational reasons. So we're here to ask these questions, to try to see uh, what answers we might find. We're here to share these stories with you all to show the reconstructed McLean house, which is reconstructed right where it was, even if it's not the original house. Um, and, it, and to show that we're in a different place now yet still. Uh, I know that Confederate memory, memorials, monuments are hot button issue. Um, I don't know that it's 
my place here or our place to have that conversation right now, um, knowing that we might bring down the auditorium. So more to say that I think it's important for us to look at how we remember these things. You know, when you come to visit a park, you're there to, to learn, to, to see new things, and to make your own determinations about how you want to move through the world today based on what you've seen. And I think it's important to remember, again, the history of these places when you visit a place like Appomattox, because it's also important to note that when the park was established and for many years of its early operation, the park was also a segregated space, much like most parks in Virginia and throughout the South. So interesting enough to say that African Americans could claim Appomattox is a place that is central to their story, not just in Appomattox and surrounding counties, but across the nation, but would, have, would not have found equal facilities or equal treatment if they visited the park for many years after its establishment. So the place remained essentially a white space for many, many years to come. So just going to finish up by asking a couple of different questions of you all that we can talk about um, once we go to question and answer, or we can talk about your questions because I'm here to help. So um, for me, some of the questions that thinking about these different narratives and these different experiences of Appomattox race for me is asking, you know, was a better piece possible? What might that have looked like? What were our goals as a nation trying to reunite and trying to come back together in the aftermath of Appomattox? How should we remember Appomattox? So in an age of contested memory, as we've already referenced, how does Appomattox fit into that picture? I think it's safe to say that Appomattox belongs to everybody, but it certainly doesn't belong to just one of those narratives. So some things to think about, happy to talk about, um, but thank you all again so much for coming um, to attend the presentation. If you have questions, comments, uh, we've got, I think, plenty of time for that. Thank you. Thank you. We have um, our microphone that'll be coming around. So if you have a question, please go ahead and raise your hands. I see a question right down front here. Yeah, uh, just a clarification on prime line. I know that uh, General Lee was made commander of all. Oh, no all Confederate forces in January of 1865. I can't, I can't hear you, I'm afraid. Okay, now it's okay? Ah, uh, yep, yeah. there you go, okay. thank you. G General Lee was yep. made commander of all Confederate forces in January of 1865, if I'm not. Uh, I think it's February, but it might be I mean, like beginning February. of February. It, but I, I thought that he had actually tendered his resignation a week before, if not a few days before Appomattox, he had actually sent it to Jefferson Davis, tendering his resignation as commander of the armies, all the Confederate armies, and just to remain commander of the Army of Northern Virginia, because he saw the writing on the wall. So um, for anyone who didn't hear the question, the question is, did Robert E. Lee tender his resignation as the commander of all armies days before Appomattox? And uh, I'm going to have to say, I, I don't know. Um, not to my knowledge, most of the scholarship that I have read asserts that he's still the commander of all armies. Um, but if so, if somebody else knows different, I'm open to that. Hey, Beth, a real softball okay. question. How many visitors per year do you get at the park? <laughs> About 65,000. Of the 55,000, any idea who would be coming there from the north versus the south? Okay. Yeah. Good question. Um, who's coming from the North versus the South? I would say it's a pretty even mix. You know, being in Virginia, we get a lot of Virginians. Um, being close to North Carolina, we also get a lot of North Carolinians. That's kind of our, our prime folks. We also get lots of folks from the DC area, Maryland, but we also get a lot of people who are coming, um, you know, following in the footsteps of their ancestors from Pennsylvania, Ohio, New York, that sort of thing. Got a question right here. But the story of the McLean house is always interesting how Wilmer McLean had resided in Manassas and to escape the war went down to Appomattox and the war kind of caught up with him, so to speak. But I've heard recently that some of that is a 
bit of a stretch that there's a myth involved. What's your take on the whole McLean move and situation? And Yeah, uh, you know, Wilmer McLean is an interesting person. Um, I think, right, if, if you owned the house where the surrender took place and you had lost, so your business was sugar, um, was in sugar, um, running the blockade and so forth, your fortune was in Confederate money, and you also owned enslaved people. And then come the end of the war, which ended in your parlor, you lost all of that wealth and that continued means of production that you may also stretch the truth in that situation as well. So um, the reality, you know, he's not wrong, right? It's more of just a stretch to say that his wife owned property in the Manassas area um, and that they were living in Manassas at the time of the battle. Uh, I think it would be a stretch to say that the battle took place on his property. I think he was about a mile or so away from the main the main battle. And he didn't move to Southside Virginia so much to escape the war as because his business, again, was in running sugar. And if you are running um, trade that the federal government would be trying to blockade, it's difficult to do that when you're in Manassas, which is an area largely occupied by federal officials through much of the war. And so for him, it made more business sense to move somewhere else. Um, perhaps keeping his family safe was part of his calculation, but from most of what we can see, it's a lot more um, financial based that he decides to move to Appomattox. But certainly after the war, he says this and he's not wrong, but he's also not quite right, I guess would be the answer. Yeah. Hold it very close to your mouth. You said there was 50% of Appomattox County was African American at the surrender time. So when they are freed, I'm assuming that most of the slaves, unlike the man that was a cobbler, were farmhands, worked the fields, and so forth. How did they survive their freedom financially? Yeah, it's a good question. So what about what about people who weren't John Robinson, basically, um, who didn't have that sort of skilled trade and the means to set themselves up? So yeah, about 50 to 53 percent of um, Appomattox County's population in 1865 was African American. Um, many of them were farm farmers, yeah, helping on farm fields, um, you know, domestic workers. So like the nine enslaved people at the McLean household were domestic enslaved people. You've got people um, in the working in the village itself at, at the Clover Hill Tavern who are, again, doing domestic tasks, cooking, taking care of the building, caring for their, their guests and such. And for a lot of these people, they don't have a lot of options when, it com when freedom comes, right? So they can do things like um, prioritize education, prioritize, you know, religion and gathering uh, ha with religious gatherings. Um, but in terms of work, things are more complicated. And a lot of people who, and this is common throughout the South, that a lot of people who were enslaved end up staying either in a very similar place that they were when they were enslaved or, you know, a couple farms over if they heard that somebody was offering better wages. But a lot of times you'd have farmers who are offering wages and employment to these people who would collaborate and say, we're all going to offer this much as our wage so that people aren't hopping plantations to get a better wage. Um, there's also laws that are put in, into the books very, very quickly into Reconstruction that is that that limits things, basically vagrancy laws, which are if you're, you're African-American and you're unemployed, you can be thrown in jail. So your chances of seeking different employment are going to be a lot harder as well. And plenty of these folks have nowhere else to go. Uh, they they don't know where their families are. Some of their families have been sold south um, or just elsewhere, and they are trying to find their families, trying to put their families back together, and leaving may not help. But plenty of folks left either during the war before emancipation was officially and, and legally recognized by the government and had formed in other communities. And some, you know, are able to, to kind of get out of their spaces and move north or move elsewhere for other opportunities. But yeah, you'll find that a lot of folks stay pretty close and do similar things to what they did during slavery, but with the 
added um, security, you know, of not being able to be sold, the added rights of citizenship, which are eroded by other reconstruction laws, but they are still there to some extent. Um, so it's an improvement, but it's still a difficult situation to be in for a lot of people. Down front. Uh, yes. Uh, how long after Appomattox did it actually take for the hostilities to really just stop? You mentioned it kind yeah. of went on it for a while. So it's it's going to be a couple months. It's not very long. You've got a few, I mean, you have some armies in the field. You, certainly the next major surrender is here. Um, about a month later, I'm trying to check the dates in my head, and I'm forgetting, uh, when the surrender at Bennett Place here took place in North Carolina. But that's going to be the next major surrender, and after that, it's a lot of small actions that bring, out, bring about surrender. So I would say that for the most part, hostilities are wrapped up by June and July of 1865, but the last surrender doesn't come until about a year later, where a ship that had been, a Confederate ship that had been at sea, learns of the surrender and surrenders in Liverpool, England of all things so but they did so without hostilities so they're not you know there's no fighting involved in that surrender so most i would say that for the most part the war is wrapped up by about june time for one more question anybody here we are all right so the question is were there any instances of guerrilla warfare after the surrender uh, the short answer is yes, but I'm going to give a medium-sized answer as well <laughs> to elaborate on that, to say that um, you have, so it's such an interesting situation, and Carrie Janey, or Dr. Carrie Janey, has just put out a new book, of, shoot, what's it called, I think the ends, the ends of War is what it's called, and it's about Lee's army after surrender and what they start to do. So in that book, she'll talk about that there are some folks who refuse to surrender, some folks who slip out from the Army of Northern Virginia in order to either first join Joe Johnston or then try to volunteer with their state's militia or do something else, but they're not ready to surrender. Um, some of them will commit small little bits of guerrilla warfare, but there's not really a lot of it. But I think probably the more overarching thing to keep in mind here is that, and there's some work done by Dr. Jim Brumall, about Confederate soldiers after the war um, and how many of the same officers of the Army of Northern Virginia and other armies are going to be the same officers that you will see in um, militant white supremacist organizations like the Ku Klux Klan and like, you know, all, there's a multitude, they have many different names, but those sort of paramilitary um, white supremacist organizations, which you could view as a form of guerrilla warfare or as a form of continuing the war for the same sorts of ends, um, depending on what kind of scholarly argument you'd like to make. But but it's essentially for many veterans, for many Confederate veterans, the war is not over yet. And they'll they'll act accordingly. when we're done uh, and I think this is one of the finest presentations we've had this year outstanding thank you thank you all so much uh, thank you so very much we really appreciate that don't forget that you can now view on zoom through facebook if you would uh, if you have the need to view the meeting that way. And in January, we will be at Generations Church. Thank you very much.